All right, let's open our Bibles, please, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Hebrews, chapter 12. Remember last week I started off talking about the name Hebrews and some of these crazy coffee carts that these churches set up, Holy Grounds Cafe and Jehovah Java. And I made fun of my JW friend I was working with who was all upset at the name Jehovah being used that way. I thought it was funny. I had some knucklehead uh, post a comment under my Sunday school video this last week saying you shouldn't make fun of Jehovah that way. And then he says, I'm unsubscribing to your channel. Why? So I, I responded to him and I said, thank you for unsubscribing. We're trying to reach people who are serious about the word of God and you'd be a waste of our time. <laughs> yeah, put that on the video. Don't edit that out either. Hopefully he watches again. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, come on. Anybody that's worried about, do you know something? And I don't know if the person himself or herself is a Jehovah's Witness, but let's just say for sake of argument that they are. They maintain that the name Jehovah is the name by which God, it was God's special name, the name by which God wants to be addressed. And I can show you, and I've got the books at home on my shelf. Come over to my house and I'll show them to you. In the Jehovah's Witness New World Translation, the footnotes they had, uh, or the, rather the reference notes at the very beginning of their 1950 New World Translation, and in their big uh, study reference Bible, 1984, I can show you right on the page, put, I'll put the words right in front of your face. They admit no one knows how to pronounce the name Jehovah. Well, if you can't pronounce it, then it can't be that big of a deal, can it? They even admit no one knows the exact pronunciation. Is it Jehovah? Is it Je Jehovah? Yahweh? Yeshua? I mean, they're at a loss to explain exactly what the pronunciation should be. And they say they've only adopted the name Jehovah, pronounced that way, because people have are used to hearing it over time. But then in another book written by Judge Rutherford in around 1920, 22, 23, which I also have on my shelf, he says, the most vital issue facing mankind is the name Jehovah. Those who have taken, those some have taken an unequivocal stand on the side of Jehovah. All those who will ever enjoy life eternal must do likewise. Well, if they don't know how to pronounce it, it can't be that big of a deal. And so basically, they don't know how to pronounce the name Jehovah. They only say Jehovah because people are used to hearing it pronounced that way over some length of time. Thirdly, uh, if you disagree with him, you won't enjoy life eternal. We haven't taught me anything yet. <laughs> That's why I make fun of it. Actually, I wasn't really making fun of the name. I'm making fun of people who make such a big deal out of it. They make me laugh. Hebrews chapter 12. Now, we're nearing the end of this chapter, and the writer lists several categories which are worth considering. Let's read verses 21 through 24 again today. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to all the, excuse me, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. He begins, verse 22, Mount Zion. That's a different spelling than Zion with a Z. The ultimate Zion and the home of God is in the third heaven. Psalm 48, verse 2 says, Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. And I like what the next verse, verse 3 in that chapter says. It says, God is known in her palaces for a refuge. Palaces, plural. 
not just many rooms or many dwelling places, John 14, like all the modern Bibles want to say, but palaces, like mansions, right? In my Father's house are many mansions, just as there are many palaces, which comprise, uh, which are composed heaven. And Psalm 50, verse 1, says, The mighty God, even the Lord, <laughs> hath spoken and called the earth. Verse 4, there, he shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. And then Psalm 50, verse 2 states, Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. The true Zion, the true Jerusalem, is out beyond the Polaris star, the North Star, Alpha Draconis, as it's sometimes called. It's over your heads, somewhere that uh, is beyond our sight. Galatians 4, verse 26, says, But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Go forward for a moment to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3. And one verse there, Revelation 3, verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will, excuse me, I will write upon him my new name. And then he says, in our list, the city of the living God, verse 22, that's going to be the same place with the same references. And after that, he says, the heavenly Jerusalem. Notice, it doesn't say New Jerusalem. Those are two different words. But the heavenly. Look back for a moment at Hebrews 11. <clears throat> Hebrews 11. Let's go back a page to chapter 11, verses uh, 14 through 16. That's what I'll read there. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. It wasn't prepared for Abraham and Sarah, but it was prepared for people like Abraham and and Sarah. And uh, I want you to look at a few verses with me. I'm just going to take you over to a few places, and we'll come back to this list. Keep your finger here. Turn back to the book of Romans, chapter 11. Romans 11. Romans 11, and notice verses 1 through 4. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What? Old English for no, K-N-O-W. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Look at verse 25 there. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, that ye should be wise in your own conceits. Here's the mystery. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That fullness is just about to come in and be complete. Right now, the Gentile peoples of the world are running everything. They run the finances. They run the uh, politics. Just about every major decision on the world stage. And they have for centuries. God's attention has not been directed at the nation of Israel like it once was or like it will be again uh, in the future. 
but uh, that fullness is just about to be come in. And he says, blindness in part. That is, there are still some Jews turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank God for them. And those who do enter into the body of Jesus Christ, and inside the body of Jesus Christ, there is no dividing between a Jew and a Gentile. The book of Galatians <clears throat> lists those distinctions being um, uh, done away with in Jesus Christ. Now, outside of Jesus Christ, the physical differences between men and women, Jew, Gentile, and so forth, still exist. But in Jesus Christ, everyone's a sinner who has to come to him the same way, as a sinner in need of forgiveness, and in need of redemption and regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Everyone is born again the same way. But look back, if you will, at Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, and we read these verses on Wednesday night, but they seem to jump into my mind again this morning as I was preparing for today. Luke 24, and uh, verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jump down to verse 32. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures, when the Lord Jesus uh, had appeared to these disciples, was the Old Testament law at that time, at that moment, uh, no longer in effect as a means of salvation? Because Christ had died and had risen? The answer would be yes. But they didn't know all that yet. Had the Holy Spirit descended on the apostles on the day of Pentecost yet? No. The church really hadn't taken off yet. And all these things were brand new. There's a, there's a development, a transitional period taking place after Christ rose between then and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and that the gospel is preached after that. And so the Jews didn't understand all that. So Christ is the fulfillment of the prophets. Christ is the fulfillment of the law. He satisfied the law in ways that the efforts of man could not do. And, uh, but God didn't do away with the existence of the Jew. We still have Jews today. God has preserved the identity of Jewish people uh, for centuries. Even if none of them can identify which tribe they uh, are ultimately descended from, and tribes have intermixed, and people have met, married with Gentile, uh, non-Jewish bloodlines over the centuries as well. But God knows who are his. God knows who are Jews, who are not, like who he will count as Jews. And I leave that up to God. I'm glad uh, it's his, his keeping, not mine. But, uh, and it is, so, so, Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Christ is the fulfillment of the prophets. And uh, he is everything that Moses and the sacrifices, the lambs and the goats and the bulls and the tabernacle and the sprinkling of all of those things were types of, foreshadows of. Jerusalem uh, is a picture of heavenly Jerusalem where God dwells. The, the, the prominence of the Jewish race is now um, overtaken by the prominence of the Gentile races in the world. That blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, which it will before much longer, and the nation of Israel will once again uh, be prominent, and the focus of God will once again be on the uh, salvation and the preservation and the ultimate exaltation of the Jewish people. That's largely what the book of Hebrews is intended to explain to the Jew. Let's continue. Verse 22, and to an innumerable company of angels. That should be self-explanatory to anybody who's ever read the Bible and has read about angels and their work and their ministry in the scriptures. But 
if you read all the references uh, to angels, where they appear, you'll find at least three prominent uh, qualities about angels in the Bible. First of all, none of them are described as female. Sorry, ladies, but that's nevertheless true. Uh, secondly, none of them are described with wings on their back. None of them are just, that's, that comes from Roman Catholic mythology and folklore over the centuries. And Dr. Ruckman was, went to hear him preach down in um, San Pedro years ago. And he says, when you draw, when an artist draws an angel, he has to put wings on their back. Otherwise, someone looks at it and says, what's that? So you put wings on their back. Oh, yeah, that's an angel. So they don't, they're not depicted as women. They're not depicted with wings on their back. And thirdly, there are no chubby cherub uh, angels in the Bible. That's more folklore. That's more imagination rather than fact. So you might say there are no women, no wings, and no diapers when it comes to describing uh, angels in the Bible. And then verse 23, to the general assembly. Now this group might be separate from the church of the firstborn, which follows immediately after, only because of the presence of a comma between them. If the firstborn, in the next clause, is Christ himself, that would make the church, in the first clause, the assembly, the New Testament body of believers. However, the term firstborn might be a reference uh, to the kinds of people who are in that church. Go back, if you will, to the book of Exodus, chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Notice there verse 22. Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. Thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. No. If that is the meaning of the term firstborn here, then the Jews or the Hebrews would be the, the assembly referred to in the preceding <clears throat> clause. Uh, Old Testament saints who made it to the place of comfort, or some, what we sometimes call Abraham's bosom. The place itself wasn't known as Abraham's bosom. It was a place of comfort. When Lazarus descended there, uh, Abraham was there, uh, and his role was to give comfort to those who came. Prior to Abraham, I don't know. But it's been called Abraham's bosom because the rich man was enjoying the comfort of Abraham. When it says, uh, I see Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, all that meant is that and I had a friend say he couldn't figure out how people's faces could be popping out of the chest of Abraham. And, and for the longest time, I didn't give it much thought. I said, well, that is a weird picture. But it simply means Abraham had his arm around Lazarus, holding him close to his bosom, giving him comfort. That's what the rich man on the other side in the place of torment saw. Um... Run back, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3, notice there verses 14 and 15. Ephesians 3, verses 14 and 15. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. It's God's family. He puts it together. It's not like the liberal idea that God is everyone's father, and uh, everyone is God's son. The fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, it doesn't, not, uh, uh, without any distinction between faith, profession, belief, religion, and so forth, that God loves everyone. I had a friend, in fact, a guy my, my brother graduated from high school with, this guy went on to uh, be some sort of a minister. Never been born again, but this guy's been everything. 
I mean, <clears throat> when I first met him 19 years ago, I mean 20 years ago, he was a uh, United Methodist minister. And uh, he got mixed up in some criminal uh, uh, enterprise, had to spend uh, about eight months in a minimum security prison, and got out. And uh, of course, the denomination really distanced themselves from him. And then uh, the next time he showed up, he had all of his garb on like a Greek patriarch. And, uh, you know, I, he, had, he had bells that jingle, jangle, jingle. Uh, and she's swinging his incense around like, uh, like the, uh, he was a member of the Russian Orthodox Church. Well, that lasted for a while. And I didn't see him for a while. Next thing you know, he comes with a turned around collar like a Roman Catholic priest. And, of course, I knew he was married. I knew he had two or three children. And uh, he said he's now a priest with what they call the Old Catholic Order. How many have ever heard that term, the Old Catholic Church? Before 1870, 1870, the Vatican I Council, uh, there was no official doctrine of the infallibility of the Pope. It was agreed upon by the Vatican I Council and the cardinals represented there. But there were a few cardinals that couldn't go that far. They, can't, they couldn't say the Pope is infallible when he speaks anything on faith. And so they, in every other way, they were in agreement with the council. But so they separated from the rest of the College of Cardinals, and uh, all of the ministers, or priests, I should say, under their authority, who ultimately give their respect to the Pope, they just don't believe he's infallible when he speaks something on church matters. So the old Catholic, they became known as the old Catholic order. They believed what was believed before Vatican I, that the Pope wasn't infallible, but he was simply the head of their church. And so they ordained their priests in exactly the same way, and, he's, and they allow their, their uh, priests also to be married. And that's the organization he became a priest in. But the guy's never been born again. And he's giving the same talk, he's rendering the same eulogy, if you kind of if can you call it that, the same devotion, the same sermonette that he used to offer when he was a United Methodist. The same thing. He hasn't changed uh, a word in the twenty some years since I've known him. But he would say, um, I believe a loving father will never turn away any of his children when they want to come back to him. I believe this with all my heart. And in my, my mind, I'm standing there having to listen to this, saying, you're an idiot, too. <laughs> but you also have a criminal past. But <laughs> we won't throw that in. Um, but the idea of the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, and so forth, it doesn't matter what you believe, you don't believe anything. In Roman Catholicism, they have what they call the baptism of desire. If someone had never been a member of the church, they were never officially baptized by a priest, but somewhere along the way, they came to the conclusion that the Catholic Church was the fountain of the truth, and that's where the truth of God would be found. And maybe some latent desire in their heart, they wanted to be a Catholic, but they never went through the motions to do so. Uh, this is what's called the baptism of desire. Because they desire to be a Catholic, that will count as though they had been baptized when they die and face God in judgment. Or, or if someone baptizes someone who's not a priest, they're not a deacon, they're not an official representative of the Catholic Church, but let's say uh, someone wants to sprinkle water on someone's forehead because they're sick, they're in the hospital, and uh, we believe that this will affect their salvation. So they, some relative does it, and that's counted as the baptism of desire. Maybe the person was unconscious, but the desire of the person was that they become a Catholic and uh, get all the benefits that come from being that. Um, and that's called the baptism of desire. So basically anyone can uh, go to heaven under the idea of, of desire. Even an atheist 
who comes to believe, well, maybe there was something good about the Catholic Church after all, and maybe I was wrong to criticize it, that can often be counted as a baptism of desire. So even atheists uh, are expected to be in heaven, according to what's being taught by contemporary Catholicism now. Uh, and let me say this once again, I will say this for all of you here and anybody watching on the internet, Roman Catholicism is nothing but a stage play in three acts. It's the same play acted out 364 days a year. The same guy is wearing the same costume, maybe it's a different actor wearing the same costume. They go through the motions, they say the same prayers, they go through the same litany, they recite the same um, thing they were taught in catechism or in parochial school. They, they go through the same, and this play starts off with the liturgy of the word, that's act one. And then it moves into the liturgy of the Eucharist, that's act two, the bread and the wine. And he holds that bread up and says, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Uh, happy are those who are called to his supper. And then sometimes the people respond with the words, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. And then they, he goes to the seemingly magical mystery tour of, of uh, pronouncing blessing over it. And then the, kid off, the altar kid off, off to the side is ringing the bell as he's holding it up. And you're supposed to believe that some miracle is taking place at that moment when you hear the sound effect. That's simply a modern-day version of the old bells on the, on the church steeples. And the reason they put the bells on the steeple was for the same reason to fool the immigrant or the farmers out there in the fields who are picking grapes, uh, and they're off 100 yards from the church. When they hear those bells, they're supposed to respect that and realize a miracle was taking place inside the church at that moment. Well, the old bells have been replaced with a kid off to the side of the stage ringing a bell. And you're supposed to be taught and conditioned to think a miracle is taking place at that moment. Nothing's taking place. Nothing's happening. Listen, if water baptism affected the new birth, it affected you being a part of the body of Christ or in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it made you a Christian, as it's often said, whatever that's supposed to mean. If water baptism is supposed to make you a Christian, now a true believer, a true convert to Jesus Christ, is supposed to change you from a sinner to now someone who's uh, accepted and received by God, doesn't it make some sense that the church who baptizes the most people would be producing the greatest results in society? Do you know which church is most represented behind prison walls? Roman Catholicism. They account for at least 40% of all the inmates in federal prison. Maybe more than that. There, is a, there are a couple of groups you don't hear represented very often in federal prisons. Uh, someone who is a devout Mormon, normally they behave themselves. Uh, you don't hear about a lot of devout Jews. They've got, other, they've got money to make. They, they're, they're, their mind, they're on other issues. So they're not out there breaking a law of law. And you don't hear about a lot of Bible believers. I mean, someone who's living for the Lord Jesus Christ, who's trying to live by the Word of God and please Jesus Christ with his life and everything he possesses, you don't hear about them getting themselves thrown in prison that often. Now, sometimes they do. Sometimes any one of those groups can break the law, and you'll find them. But the church that, uh, that uh, ostensibly is, produce, is making more people Christians should also be producing the greatest, most beneficial results to society. But they're not. All right, I'm just going down a, a, a path at dead end, so I'm going to get back to the main road here. But it's God's family. God's the one that puts it together. There is no such thing as the fatherhood of God, of God and the brotherhood of man. Everyone's going to heaven regardless of what they profess or believe. Uh, actually, the whole family, as Paul says in Ephesians 3, has eight specific groups, and, uh, and I'll list the, the, I'll give you the list of the eight groups, and we're not going to delve into each one, uh, maybe for another, another time we will, but I'll give you the eight groups, 
and they run like this. There's a company of Gentile believers found before the time of the law. Think of Adam. Think of Noah. There was a company of Gentile believers who became Hebrew believers when God began to appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The, there was no identity of Jew versus Gentile before God appeared to Abraham. Everybody was a Gentile, if you want to call it that. There's a third company of Jewish believers under the law. That ran from Moses and Mount Sinai all the way through John the Baptist. Fourthly, there would be a company of Gentile believers under the time of the law. Romans chapters 1 and 2 go into detail about that. Romans 2, about verse 15, 16, um, who the, the Bible says the Gentiles, whose conscience bearing witness, their thoughts also the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another, and that the Gentiles, which had not the law, did by nature the things contained in the law. Those having not the law were a law unto themselves. Fifth, there would be the body of believers who are called the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This church age, which is you, what you and I are part of. And it'll run from Acts chapter 2 until the rapture takes place, which I hope is before lunchtime. A sixth group would be tribulation Jews. And the Antichrist will seek to hunt them down and persecute them wherever he can. And then tribulation Gentiles. Those who, who are earning their salvation by some faith in Jesus Christ and an understanding that it has to be coupled with good works and to preserve the Jew and protect the Jew during his greatest time of persecution. And then an eighth group we could say were, would be millennial saints. After the tribulation is over, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to set up his earthly kingdom. Millennium simply means, in old Latin words, means 1,000 years, if you want to know the definition of that word. Then back to our text, he's, he lists God, the judge of all. That's also self-explanatory, uh, which matches what we read earlier in Hebrews chapter 10. Look back in Hebrews 10, and verses 28 to 30. Hebrews 10, uh, 28 to 30. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing? and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. So God is the judge of all. And then the next thing he lists, the spirits of just men made perfect. Look um, back a little bit at the book of Titus. Titus chapter 1. Titus 1, and I'll start at verse 7, verses 7 and 8. Titus 1, verses 7 and 8. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, uh, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, so forth and so on. Paul doesn't talk about just men, but he talks about Christians being just in their dealings along the way. To be just, as a word to, to define you, is an Old Testament concept, much as being a good man or a righteous man or conversely an evil man or a wicked man. Those Titles are given all through the Old Testament, but those, are all, those things were all based on your degree of obedience to the commands of God and to the law. Run back, if you will, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 10. Proverbs 10. 
right after the book of Psalms and just before Proverbs 11. Some of you didn't catch that. One of you caught that. Proverbs 10. And uh, verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> Blessings are upon the head of the just, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Also look down uh, verse 20. The tongue of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is little worth. And verses 30 and 31. The righteous shall never be removed, but the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. The mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom, but the froward tongue shall be cut out. And so uh, verses like that all through the Old Testament, particularly the... the uh, uh, counterbalance of one versus another in the books of Psalms and Proverbs. So a just man, that may be, that phrase might be able to be appropriated to a believer as a just man devotionally, but literally, uh, doctrinally, it's an Old Testament saint, and it will fit Tribulation saints again in the future. Run forward again to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. I know I, I ask you to turn to a lot of scripture, and I applaud you for trying to do so, and uh, I appreciate some of you who try to write them down quickly enough and make notes. And sometimes my bouncing from verse to verse isn't as smooth, as smooth as it could be. And I don't know if it's a, a matter of me having not uh, memorized enough of it uh, with too many pieces of paper on the podium here. No, I'll blame it on the podium there. <laughs> um, yeah, or just what it is, but I apologize for that. But anyway, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, notice, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Look also at Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Faith plus works coupled together will identify a righteous man in the tribulation. You say, well, how much faith and how much works is required? How much of each would be necessary? And the best answer is, I have no idea, because I don't plan to be here. Yeah. <laughs> and if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, you have no reason to plan on being here. Whenever someone says, the church age, or the church is going to have to go through the tribulation, then you want to tell them, well, then there is no tribulation, is there? And they ask, what do you mean? Well, if the church goes through the tribulation, then it's effectively still the church age. There is no tribulation. Tribulation hasn't begun yet. What are we going to say? That someone gets saved here and they have uh, the promise of eternal security uh, at one point, but then somewhere along the timeline, suddenly you're going to enter the tribulation and suddenly your salvation is up for grabs. It's not safe any longer. It's, it's, it's in jeopardy. You might lose it if you're not careful. You don't maintain good works. You don't help the Jew in his time of faith. Make sure you don't take the mark of the beast. You can't tell me that we have to go from grace by, by grace uh, through faith uh, plus nothing for my salvation to a place where I've got to make sure I don't worship the Antichrist or take his mark. Well, where does that change take place at? So whenever someone says something idiotic like the church is going to go through the tribulation, you answer them, the Bible says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. You want to tell them, well then, it's not the tribulation yet, is it? It's effectively still the church age, if the church is still here. All right. So, uh, and then verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Again, that should be self-explanatory, but let me give you a couple of verses to uh, illustrate that to another uh, 
knucklehead you might you might run into. Go to Deuteronomy chapter six. Deuteronomy six. Deuteronomy six. Notice there verse twenty five. Deuteronomy 6, verse 25. And it shall be, notice, our righteousness, if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. We'll do exactly what we've been told to do, and it will be down to our righteousness. God will take notice of it. Also, Joshua, the next book, Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, then thou shalt have good success. Success in this world and prosperity in this world and what man perceives as the blessings of God would all be dependent on someone's level of obedience to the commandments of God. Contrast that with what Paul says in the New Testament. Titus chapter 3. Sorry, yeah, Titus chapter 3. I'm going to try to move along quickly for time's sake. Titus 3 and verse 5. What, what does the Apostle Paul write? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost who washes and regenerates and renews the sinner when the sinner comes to God by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It had nothing to do with you or your effort. Look back at, at um, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and notice verse 17. You'll like this. Romans 1, verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul's quoting from the Old Testament. Go back to the book of Habakkuk, where the quotation is taken from. You can go tell your friends, we were in the book of Habakkuk today. I guarantee you, there's not another church in Ontario, uh, very few in Southern California, that are making reference to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2, and here's where Paul gets that quote from. Habakkuk 2, verse 4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, notice, but the just shall live by his faith. When Paul quotes it, he doesn't use the word his. He omits that. But he takes the verse and he applies it to what he's trying to say in the book of Romans. Salvation is no longer based upon your effort, your work, your diligence, your obedience, your memory, your um, no. work. It's now based entirely upon you trusting the work of Jesus Christ. When Paul and Silas told the Philippian jailer, Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what they meant. Believe entirely on him. Believe on what he's done. Believe on what he's able to do. You know, um, if it's kind of like the Catholic idea of saints. We're going to proclaim someone to be a saint because of their godly, virtuous life while they were living. That always made no sense to me. How is it that a group of men still living here on the earth, they haven't died yet, they don't know what's beyond the veil uh, in, in eternity, in the invisible world. Doesn't it seem to make some sense, those of us uh, uh, Caucasians, who think in terms of a timeline, you know, something starts over here and it works here and works here and works here until it reaches a conclusion. Doesn't it make some sense that those who have died have gone farther than we've gone? They've seen things that we haven't seen yet. They know what's beyond the, the, the death's door that we don't know yet. We speculate, we conjecture, we base what we 
profess and claim to believe on what we read. But those who have died, they've gone farther than we've gone yet. If they have been exalted to something higher, then they might be in a position to, to bless us. But a bunch of fat men in the Vatican are not in any position to bless them. We're going to make you a saint. The guys, I'm already in heaven. Or I'm already beyond your life. What can you give me? They, you, we can't give them anything. It's theoretically some Christian who's died. They might, let's, con conceivably, they might be in a position to offer some blessing for our sake. I don't know if that's true or not. There are a great cloud of witnesses witnessing uh, to our lives as believers who have gone ahead. But um, every time the Catholic Church makes a mortal man or woman a saint, aren't they diminishing the ultimate power of Jesus Christ just a little bit more? He's no longer the one we depend upon for everything. We depend upon Jesus and St. Bartholomew and St. Joseph and St. Gertrude and St. Every time they declare another saint, um, I think there's something like um, somewhere between 1,100 and 2,000 Roman Catholic saints that have been named over the centuries. And they don't, all the, the, the books on saints don't all agree on how many are officially saints. And you don't know if the Episcopal Church or the Lutheran Church accept the saints of Catholicism either, or if they've named their own saints. Well, the Russian Orthodox, if they have a concept of saints, do they accept the same uh, list, roster, as the Roman Catholic Church has? But um, Habakkuk 2, verse 4, the just shall live by his faith. When Paul quotes it, Romans 1, 17, he leaves out the word his, because it's no longer your effort. And that not of yourselves, the faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works that same man should boast. Now, like I say, I'm trying to move along here. Verse um, 24, And to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Uh, notice the continual reference to the Old Testament along the lines here in the book of Hebrews. Abel, firstborn, Moses, the law, Sinai, things in Exodus, um, Abel's blood spoke, uh, the book of Habakkuk, and so forth. Uh, Moses' blood, or uh, Abel's blood, spoke, as it were, much in the same way that phenomena like the day and night speak, according to Psalm 19, first four verses there. They declare the glory of God. Abel's blood testified to three things. I'll try to hurry it up. Number one, you can't get blood from a turnip. That's point number one. Um, Abel brought a sacrifice. Cain did not. God had respected Abel's uh, offering. He did not respect Cain's. Um, his blood shows that the life of the flesh is in the blood, Leviticus 17, 11. And without shedding of blood is no remission, Hebrews 9, 22, for sins. Uh, secondly, his blood spoke and said, um, you can't get away with murder. He said, the blood of thy brother's blood crieth out from the ground. Abel's blood cried out for vengeance. There's still no statute of limitations on murder. But don't worry, the liberals and the Democrats are working on that too. And the Catholic Church is working on that too. Ever since Genesis 9, verses 5 and 6, um, um, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. The, the, what we call the dispensation of human government began, and man was now responsible for managing his own affairs and dealing with his own uh, crime and criminality and judging those who are guilty to maintain order in society. He's done a pretty bang-up job about that, too, hasn't he? But you say, well, nowhere in the Gospels did the Lord Jesus talk about the death penalty or capital punishment. It's not, a, not around anymore in the New Testament. Ah, go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 25. Acts chapter 25. 
is the same God <clears throat> who sent the Lord Jesus Christ as our substitute and the sacrifice for our sins, the same God who commanded the death penalty in the Old Testament? Of course he is. And uh, was that command given um, in Genesis 9 even before the law of Moses was ever thought of? Yes. Look at Acts chapter 25. Notice what the Apostle Paul says about himself. Verse 11. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. So the apostle to the New Testament church, um, in effect, concludes that the death penalty is still in effect. And if he had done anything deserving of it, he hauled men and women to prison, but the Bible never says he murdered anybody. You have to be very careful when you read the story of the apostle Paul. And the Bible nowhere says that he committed a murder or murdered anyone for their faith in Jesus Christ. He wanted to stamp it out, would have killed Christians if he could. The Bible nowhere does, uh, says that he did so. And uh, the punishment for, cap for uh, uh, murder is still capital punishment here in 2019. He says, um, I refuse not to die, but if there be none of these things where these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. So the blood of Abel <clears throat> said you can't get away with murder. Uh, thirdly, the blood of Abel pictured a shepherd who tended sheep, and he offered a lamb as his sacrifice, and then he himself died as a lamb, who had, hadn't done anything wrong. All he had done is what God had commanded by bringing the offering of the, of the uh, sacrifice as God had commanded. It's sort of like the picture of, of, in the Lord Jesus' case, he was the Lamb of God who taken away the sin of the world, John 1, but then he offered himself as a lamb, a spotless lamb without a spot or wrinkle, much as we're supposed to be regarded as because we're going to be made like him one day. Think of the story of Abraham taking the wood and the fire and Isaac going up Mount Moriah and uh, Isaac said, where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Moses said, my son God shall provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And Isaac allows his father to tie him to the altar. So in a sense, he, in a type, rather I should say a foreshadow, a type, Isaac was the lamb, but God, Abraham uh, came through that with flying colors. He had the knife in his hand, and God stopped him at the last moment, and Isaac was free to go, and there was a, a ram caught in a thicket. He slew that instead. So a great typology in the death of Abel. But verse 24, And to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Christ's blood also preaches to us, number one, it preaches to us that God was indeed manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3, verse 16, and therefore that God had blood through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And without you turning, I'll just run to the verse and read it for you. Acts 20, verse 28, Paul says to the elders in Ephesus, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So the idea that through, and through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, God indeed had blood. Secondly, Christ's blood preaches a completed redemption. Unlike the sprinkling of the Passover sacrifice, the Passover blood, I look at uh, Hebrews 11 and... Uh, Verse 28, Hebrews 11, verse 28, through faith, he, that's Moses, kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, that he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And also, Christ's blood preaches an inner cleansing and a purification of the person, of the individual, that wasn't possible with Abel's sacrifice. Abel was simply doing what he was told to do, as directed by God to do. And uh, the sinner brought a sacrifice 
to the Levites later in the Bible, but simply bringing the sacrifice and doing what you were told to do didn't mean that you were perfect to start with. In fact, it was proof that you, weren't, you hadn't been perfect. It was testimony that you hadn't been perfect. Um, it's interesting. I'm just now, thought just now comes to me, and we're going to close right there, that someone who does great things, that, or so they think, in the name of God and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they make some sacrifice. They've been, let's say they've been, you know, just pick whatever sin you want to think of. They can say, well, I'm going to give it up now. And they give it up. They no longer do it. They no longer engage in it. And uh, now they are filled with pride. See, look at me. That proves I'm a pretty good person. No, that simply proves that you hadn't been a good person. That's why you have to give it up. By bringing a sacrifice to the altar, to the Levites, the priests, that didn't impart to you some virtue. That proved you had no virtue. That's why you had to bring it. If you had virtue, you wouldn't have to bring it. You never read of the Lord Jesus Christ ever having to go to the temple and offer a sacrifice during his life because he had no sins. John chapter 8, which of you convinceth me of sin? And the, his accusers had nothing to say. They couldn't accuse him of a single time he had broken the law or sinned against the laws of Moses. <laughs>